I'm Fergus Noble. Um, this is. And I'm Colin Bigley. Um, we're from uh, Swift Navigation. Um, So uh, this is going to be a talk in three parts. Um, first of all, we're going to try and uh, uh, give you some motivation as to why GPS would be interesting, an interesting topic for hackers. Um, then the bulk of the talk is really going to be um, a technical discussion about how GPS works, because we think this is really interesting, and not many people you know, know all the details. There's a lot of good stuff there. So we're going to focus on that. And then at the end, we're going to present a couple of new tools that we've um, that we've been working on, which uh, should provide a nice platform for, for hackers to, uh, to experiment with this stuff. Uh, there's a link up there. Actually, that notes PDF is not yet available. We'll try and get it up there um, shortly after the, after the talk. And if uh, we'll be in the Q&A room, room three, it's um, just uh, right out of the door and then right again um, after the talk for about an hour or so. OK. OK. Wow, there's a lot of people here. We we're kind of worried about uh, after the celebrations last night that anyone, there wouldn't be anyone here. But uh, I guess we have the opposite problem. Um, so uh, why is GPS interesting for hackers? Why are we doing a DEF CON presentation about it? Um, well, there, I mean, GPS devices are ubiquitous. There, there are estimated to be uh, like in the high hundreds of millions of them uh, in various devices around the world. Um, so they, they're very common and very widely used, but there are very few open source projects that implement uh, a high performance embedded GPS receiver. Um, none, in fact, other than ours that we know of. Um, and so we, uh, yeah, we, we think that it um, is a, a project that we experienced in you guys. Um, there, so there are a lot of different use cases for GPS receivers that are not, it's, it's hard to design a proprietary receiver that meets all these different use cases optimally. And so we feel that having a, an open platform al allows people to, to optimize the receiver for their own particular application, which is uh, very useful. Um, there's a lot of uh, different hacker projects that use it. There's been a lot of uh, open source UAV stuff that uh, has uh, um, become very popular in recent years. Um, there's a lot of uh, open source um, inertial sensing stuff for these platforms, and we feel that uh, an open source GPS platform would go quite well with these. Um, and then there's uh, the black hat, white hat uh, dynamic where there is, like, all of our infrastructure depends highly on GPS and on the unencrypted signals, which um, there's massive, massive vulnerabilities there. Uh, you know, financial systems all depend on it, communication systems, transportation systems, you name it. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting problems there um, with jamming and spoofing uh, these uh, these infrastructure that uh, are quite interesting. Okay, so um, I thought I'd kind of uh, explain how we ended up here um, and you know how this project got started. Um, Colin and I met at a company called Joby Energy. Uh, we used to make um, work on making. It was kind of a crazy project. So, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So. Uh, we uh, were working on uh, building high altitude wind turbines, which is where you, you take a, a rigid winged kite, put some big propellers on it, tether it to the ground, and fly it up like a kite into the jet stream, and um, you know hope to generate power. Uh, and uh, so the photo you've got here is um, one of our prototypes. Uh, it's just like a little, uh, I think it was a couple meter span, um, conventional uh, UAV, basically only with a tether holding it to the ground. And you would fly this thing up, um, and it would autonomously fly circles um, into the wind. And this thing was pulling like eight Gs continuously. Uh, I don't know the airspeed, like 100 miles an hour, 20 feet off the ground. Um, and we were looking for GPS systems which could, you know, offer that kind of uh, performance. Um, and we really just couldn't find anything that was suitable. Um, 
and we, we also couldn't find any open source platforms which we could use to adapt to, uh, to, to our needs either. So we decided to, to start our own project. Um, and uh, we worked on it with JB Energy for a couple of years and um, a couple of months ago I decided to, to, to spin off and, uh, and start working on it full time. Um, so I guess that's what, why we got here. You know, we really found this need to have a, a flexible, customizable platform um, which you could, could use in these um, you know, high dynamic environments, uh, other more demanding applications than, than could be, uh, could be met, met by just the, the type of GPS you have in your cell phone. Um, so here's another UAV platform that uh, we think will benefit greatly from <laughs> this project. Uh, I want to insert a plug for our friends at Transition Robotics. They're giving uh, a talk tomorrow about uh, Paparazzi, the uh, open source autopilot. And that's at 3 tomorrow? It's on Sunday at 4. Or Sunday, sorry. Yeah, Sunday at 4. Um, uh, yeah, so like centimeter level position hold um, for things like this, uh, autonomous landing. Um, yeah, there's many different applications. And uh, another huge uh, area of application is research. Um, spoofing and jamming, you guys may have heard about Todd Humphrey um, in the University of Texas at Austin, um, their recent demonstration of uh, bringing a drone out of the sky with spoofing. Um, there's, there are many, uh, jam um, sorry, uh, there, there are many uh, uh, cases of uh, just very simple, like um, uh, jamming devices, uh, airport, yeah. um, Yeah, so uh, like there's there's been cases of um, oh man, Can you so, yeah, there's, uh, there's there's been a couple of cases recently where um, uh, truckers have been uh, the trucking companies have been installing GPSs in um, all of their vehicles so that uh, their drivers don't drive drive too many hours so they they take all the breaks they're supposed to take. Uh, and of course, people have made these very simple, uh, just like white noise source, it, source jammers, which uh, block the GPS signal so they can, you know, drive longer or whatever. And uh, there's been a couple of cases recently where people, you know, these, these trucks have pulled up um, outside airports. And I think, um, I can't remember the airfield in question, but uh, it like shut down a major international airport for a day until someone found it. And this is just a really simple device. So. Uh, there's a lot of work. It's like a, it's a, a very open area. How can we combat uh, jamming or, or, or spoofing and detect it? Um, or also, you know, what, what techniques could we um, could we implement to you know to, to do more sophisticated jamming or spoofing, more on the you know kind of attacking side of things? But uh, yeah, do you want to take over yeah. for us? Um, there's been a lot of research into. Uh, um, what's called multipath, which you tend to get in places like urban canyons. Um, in a, a metropolitan area with like very large buildings, you don't know exactly where the signal is coming from. It could be coming from the satellite or bouncing off something. Um, there, there are other uh, what are called GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, other than GPS. Um, the Russians built one called GLONASS, which is also uh, fully operational, but not quite as cool. Some kind of weird engineering decisions there, but um, uh, Galileo, um, which is the uh, new European uh, system that is being brought up. Um, Compass is a regional, um, or no, that's big. Um, Compass uh, is a system developed by uh, China, um, and then there's a whole host of advanced positioning techniques that there's a lot of research into. Uh, you have carrier phase RTK, which um, can give you down to a few centimeters resolution. Um, survey grade post processing, which um, can give you into the millimeter range. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, research with fusing uh, inertial sensors into uh, positioning systems with the GPS. 
Okay, so um, I guess we'll move on to the kind of the, the meat of the presentation. Hopefully that's given you a, a bit of a justification as to why, you know, this might be an interesting area uh, to look at. Um, so uh, we're going to give you a run through of how GPS works, just in basic terms. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing um, we're going to look at is, is how you might find um, the position of the receiver. Um, basically, this works through um, uh, measuring distances from satellites. So, if you imagine you have um, have uh, your GPS satellite somewhere in space here, if you imagine you had some magic ruler through space where you could just measure the distance, um, not the vector, just the just the the, the distance um, from the satellite to your receiver, if you had just one satellite then knowing that one distance puts your receiver anywhere on the surface of a sphere um, of, of a constant distance away from the satellite. Uh, if you imagine you had two satellites now and you had a distance for each of them, um, then where those two spheres intersect, you're left with just a circle. So now we know, um, given the distances from two satellites, that our receiver must be somewhere on, on a circle. And you see how this is going to go. If we add three, then we're going to be left with two, just two points where um, these spheres intersect. You could imagine if you took any two pairs of those spheres, they're going to make a circle, and then the two circles are going to intersect at only one point, uh, only two points. And um, usually in practice, um, this would be enough to, 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 to determine the position of the receiver, because one of those points is almost always like, miles off in space and can be completely discarded. So um, given some, some uh, assumptions about where a sane position for the receiver to be is, that pretty much locks it down to, uh, to just one position. So if, if we can measure these distances, then uh, that's how we're going to go about finding our, our position. Note also you need to know the positions of the satellites in space um, in order to, to, to give some coordinates to that, that point. Um, However, there's one slight complication. Um, we don't have any way, uh, any you know, magic space ruler to measure these distances. Um, all we can do is, or the best we can do, is measure a, a time of flight um, of a signal sent from the satellite to the receiver. Um, and this time, uh, you know, uh, with the speed of light, gives, gives you a distance. The trouble is um, the clock on the receiver is not synchronized to the clocks on the satellites. All the satellites have a synchronized clock, so they all transmit the signal at the same time. But you, you don't know exactly when they did it, because you, you may have some error in your clock. So that, that corresponds to um, uh, an amount of time, an unknown amount of time added to, in common to all of these, uh, these times of flight, which is unknown. And, uh, the way we get around that is actually by adding a fourth satellite, and that just locks down that extra degree of freedom, gives you the extra information you need to uniquely determine um, that unknown time period. So, you know, it's just four equations, four unknowns, um, which is why, you know, in your, if you've got a GPS receiver in your car or something, it will only start giving you a position solution when it's got four satellites. So now we know it's all about distances to the satellites. So how can we measure these distances? Um, so we can't measure the distances directly with our magic ruler, so we measure flight times instead. So you can see at the top here we uh, have a diagram, di the distance between the satellite's antenna and the antenna on Earth. Um, at the bottom, we have uh, an impulse traveling from our satellite that starts at time equals zero, and it arrives at our antenna on Earth at time equals distance divided by the speed of light. So given that we know the speed at which these waves travel, all we need to know is the time to, to figure out the distance. Um, so how can we uh, measure that time? We can measure the time by measuring the phase of certain codes that the satellites transmit. So in this diagram, you can see two satellites, and they, are, they each transmit a unique code. Um, these codes are um, for the signals that we're discussing. 
are 123 bits long. That, that's 123, not 124, or, or 1,023, not 1,024, excuse me. Um, and they're transmitted at a rate of 1.023 megahertz, which gives them a period of one millisecond. So what we do is we measure the relative flight time of these signals. So you can see that each, each uh, start, the, the start of each signal is transmitted at the same time from each satellite. You can see bit N, they're, they both just transmitted. Um, and, but for satellite one, we've just received, or are just about to receive bit zero. For satellite two, we're just about to receive bit 42, which illustrates that we, we receive the start of the, the start of each of those periods at different times. So we measure the relative phase between those, which gives us the relative distance to each of the satellites. Note there's still a common offset that we don't know, which um, it, when we solve for the time, um, that, that fourth uh, variable, then we're able to eliminate that. Okay, so let's uh, talk a bit about the low level details of how um, these signals are actually transmitted, uh, how they're modulated, um, and what's sent from the satellite. So as Colin said, uh, the, I guess the, uh, the main, the main uh, thing which is transmitted is, is what we call the code. It's a 1,023 bit um, uh, bit sequence, uh, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail, you know, how that's actually derived. Um, it's uh, transmitted at a bit over a megahertz, so it's uh, got a period of, of one millisecond per code. Um, but this code is, is fixed. It's the same um, code just repeating over and over again uh, for a given satellite. Each satellite may have, or, or does have, a different code, but for a given satellite, that code is fixed. Um, and now, whilst it's going to allow us to derive some timing information, we can't use that to transmit any data because we can't change anything. So um, piggybacking on top of that code, uh, we've got, we're going to add a, a low speed data channel, um, what's called a navigation message or navigation data. And that's a, a 50 bode um, uh, data message. And, and that's modulated just by flipping all of the bits in the code. Uh, so every, I said the code's got a period of one millisecond, so 50 bode, so it's 20 milliseconds. Every 20 repetitions of the code, we're just going to flip all of the bits um, in that code, depending on whether we want to send a, a one or a zero in our navigation data message. Um, so taking those two things together, um, you know, the code, the code and the navigation message, um, that's going to give us our, our bit stream that we want to send. Um, and then that's just uh, modulated um, using uh, a pretty common technique called binary phase shift keying. Um, also note the, the time scales here are, 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 are really not to scale because the carrier is at uh, just over one and a half gigahertz. Um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, flip the sign of the carrier um, depending on whether we want to, to transmit a one or a zero. Um, because it's, it's, it's a, a binary phase, phase shift uh, keying system, we've only got two phases, uh, zero or 180 degree phase shift. So that's just the same as flop, uh, flipping the sign on the carrier. So I guess that's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very common modulation scheme. Um, okay. So the next thing is, uh, um, that might be of some interest is how we get this, um, this uh, radio signal into the digital domain so we can do some processing on it. Um, I'll just go through this really quickly because I um, don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, you know, we have some antenna. Um, the GPS signals are really, really weak. So first thing we're going to do is amplify them um, with a really pretty high gain, very low noise amplifier. Um, there's like a bunch of other things in that piece of spectrum. A few other um, satellite navigation systems are there and different uh, uh, you know, other things that we, we, we're not interested in. So the next thing we're going to do is just filter all of that stuff out, just have a, a, a nice narrow band pass filter, which is going to select just our GPS signals. It's about two megahertz of bandwidth that, that we're interested in. Um, this is a very like common uh, radio architecture. Uh, you know, almost every every radio works in this the same way. Um, 
So now we've got our two megahertz uh, bit of um, GPS spectrum that we're interested at, still um, up around one and a half gigahertz. And that's uh, obviously way too, too fast to be easily sampled by a, an analog to digital converter. So what we're going to do is just shift that two megahertz chunk of spectrum down uh, from, say, you know, whatever it is, one, one and a half to one and a half gigahertz plus two megahertz down to just zero to two megahertz. Um, this works basically if you remember uh, your trig identities. Uh, if you multiply two sinusoids, you get um, a sum uh, a sum, frequent, a sum of frequencies and a, a difference frequency. Um, so if, uh, if we take uh, this thing called a mixer, which is just a multiplier, basically an analog multiplier, and we generate our own local sinusoid um, of uh, a frequency close, but not exactly the same as our carrier, then what we're going to do is um, uh, end up with, with a difference of those frequencies. So say we set this to this local oscillator to, to um, two megahertz different from our carrier, uh, then the difference in those frequencies is going to be two megahertz, and we're going to end up with um, uh, you know, that same signal shifted down zero to two megahertz. And we're also going to have a, another component, which is the sum of frequencies, which is going to be way off at like three gigahertz or something. So the next stage is to just filter that out. Uh, and we're left with our, our signal um, shifted down where we can just sample it directly with an ADC. Okay. So um, now let's talk about how we can, uh, can measure this code phase that we talked about. Um, so just uh, introduce a couple of, um, I guess, mathematical uh, bit of background. Uh, I'm sure most, you know, a lot of you will be familiar with this, but it doesn't hurt to go through it again. Um, the basic uh, way we're going to measure the code phase, um, just uh, just going back to so the code phase, is this is this idea of which, which bit you're on in your sequence in your in your code. You want to um, determine you know uh, what position you're currently receiving at, so that you can compare the signals from the different satellites. So um, the way we do this is is all centered around uh, correlations. So to just go, go back over um, what a correlation is, uh, what we're going to do is imagine we have uh, two different uh, bit sequences. Um, what we're going to do is, is take, take, take them uh, bit by bit and just compare the two bits. So you could say uh, multiply the two bits. And if, um, if they're the same, then we're going to put a, a plus one. And if they're like in this, uh, this lower diagram, if they're different, then we're going to put a minus one. And we're going to go through the whole sequence and just um, compare the bits bit by bit, and then add up all these plus ones and minus ones that we've collected at the bottom to give us uh, give us uh, our correlation. That's just a, a you know a, a numeric answer, and um, this is a, a kind of metric of how similar two signals are. Um, if it's a higher number, then then they're uh, closer 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 to each other in some sense. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you had two signals that were the same, and you uh, uh, performed this operation and shifted one of the signals relative to, an, to the other, well, f imagine, first of all, that you didn't shift it at all, then, of course, all the bits are going to be the same. So our, uh, ev every, every uh, bit down here is going to be a plus one, and the, uh, the sum is just going to be the length of the bit sequence. Um, this would be a, a perfect correlation. Uh, now imagine we had some had the same uh, same signal, but now we shifted it one bit to the right it's down here. Um, a lot of the bits are now not going to line up, and if we had some some you know longer sequences with uh, where there were several high bits in a row, for example, you might get some bits still correlating, but on the whole, it's going to be massively uh, massively reduced um, magnitude of the correlation. Um, so that's a correlation where you just take these two two bit sequences, compare them, and come up with this uh, this this sum, which which tells you how similar they are. Uh, a simple extension to that is a cross correlation, where we're going to take uh, two signals and um, perform a correlation multiple times with different shifts, like a like we've got these two two here with a shift of zero and one. If you imagine you plotted on a graph all the different possible shifts you could have could have uh, shifted by and what the correlation ended up as for those shifts, then you can build up um, a plot of the cross-correlation. 
So at zero, obviously, you're always going to have a have a peak, but then uh, for many signals, you know, you, you might find that it would tail off pretty quickly after um, after you move away from zero. Uh, so now let's uh, talk about uh, the codes that the the GPS satellites transmit. Uh, these are um, uh, were invented by a, a, a man named Gold, so they're called Gold Codes. Um, it's a special uh, optimal set of codes um, which have some certain nice properties which we're going to use to, um, uh, to allow, which are going to directly allow us to implement this, um, this code phase measurement using correlations. Uh, they're, they're all, uh, you can generate a set of Gold Codes for uh, any length 2 to the n minus 1 and there are going to be um, two to the n minus one different codes in that set of the same length, um, and they have basically two nice properties, um, and they can be shown to have to be the optimal uh, the optimal bit sequences having these properties. So if you take uh, take a gold code and perform the co uh, the cross correlation with itself. Um, your what you find is that obviously. Um, it, at zero, it's going to have a peak, but um, the gold codes have this uh, this optimal property of of uh, having very low correlation elsewhere other than at a shift of zero. So you can say that autocorrelation is is as good as you can get an approximation to a delta function for a finite length code, um, and we'll see how that's going to be useful in a second. The other property is I said um, for a uh, there there are Many gold codes, of a, you know, if you give, have a certain length, there are many gold codes in that set. If you take two different ones and perform the cross correlation between two different gold codes in the same set, you'll find that their cross correlation is zero everywhere, or close to zero, as close as you can get to zero everywhere for a finite length code. Um, and these two properties together are going to be very useful for um, implementing our code phase measurement. So, how do we put this into practice? Um, if we uh, if we imagine we're performing this uh, this correlation operation again, um, and the two bit sequences we're going to use are what, what we get from our uh, analog front end, the received signal, and what we're going to do is um, is generate a local copy in software of the code that the satellite we know the satellite is transmitting. Each satellite is transmitting a different one of these gold codes in the, out of the same set. So say we, we knew we were looking for satellite number 10, then we would locally generate the, um, the gold code corresponding to that satellite. Um, and what we're going to do is just uh, uh, try a number of different shifts, uh, uh, or, or rather find the, the cross correlation uh, between the incoming signal that we, we're receiving and this locally generated copy of the code. Just by shifting this locally generated code bit, uh, uh, forwards and backwards as the as the receiver is running, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll we, we you know we can generate this cross correlation plot, and um, we should see a peak. Um, if we if we remember the gold codes had this delta function like autocorrelation property, um, when when our locally generated code is um, has a shift of zero relative to the received code, we're going to get a, a massive peak in our correlation. Um, so if we're trying to find the the phase of the um, received code, it's enough to just shift our locally generated code backwards and forwards until we find this correlation peak, and then we know that our locally generated code must be in in perfect phase alignment with the received code. Um, and you know, of course, because we generated our locally generated code, we uh, we know its phase. So that allows us to measure the code phase. Uh, the second uh, uh, property of these gold codes is going to allow us to receive from multiple satellites, which is pretty useful, seeing as you need at least four satellites to to get a solution. All of the GPS satellites transmit on the same frequency. Um, and uh, you know they're, they're transmitting data modulated in pretty much the same way. So you'd think, how, how are you going to distinguish between different satellites? Um, if we uh, uh, think back to the, the, this uh, this property of the gold codes, that two different gold codes have zero cross correlation, um, then 
we can see that actually if we, well, if we performed um, this cross cor correlation between, uh, say, satellite A, code from satellite A, and we locally generate satellite A's um, uh, gold code, then it's going to have this delta function like uh, uh, cross correlation allowing us to pick out this peak. But if instead we were locally generating a code for satellite B, then it's going to be zero everywhere. So it's going to make no contribution to, um, to, the, to the correlation that we measure. So basically, uh, this property of gold codes allows us to, to have the satellites uh, uh, independent from, from one another, even though we're, we're, uh, we're receiving them on the same frequency. Okay, so just to sum up why gold codes are cool, um, they pretty much are the, the, the key idea in GPS. Um, there's really three things. They allow us to get this phase information, which is, allows us to measure the time of flight. This is, um, you know, really the, the, the main measurement we want to make. Um, they, uh, as I just said, they allow us to transmit uh, on the same frequency for all of the satellites and distinguish between them. This is basically a form of CDMA, um, same technique that's used in uh, modern mobile phone networks. Um, and the third thing is, which I haven't really mentioned, is it um, allows us to pick up this really, really weak signal. The GPS signal is actually uh, below the thermal noise floor of the receiver, so just the, the, the heat in all of the components um, in your receiver, like uh, knocking carriers around in the silicon, is going to contribute more noise than the actual s signal from the GPS satellites itself. Um, so we need, we need some way to, um, to be sensitive to such a, a small signal. And really it comes back to the fact that when we're doing, performing uh, a correlation, we're effectively integrating over a, over a long period. Um, whilst, uh, so, so any noise is going to average to zero, but any contribution from the code is going to be amplified. And so in the case of GPS, we've got 1,023-bit codes where we're integrating over 1,023 bits or a whole millisecond. So this gives us a, a huge gain in sensitivity. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, there's another detail that we haven't discussed yet, which is that the satellites are moving so quickly and the frequency that um, the signals are transmitted on is so high that there is a... Um, a non-insignificant Doppler shift on the signal when it reaches us that, um, of a couple kilohertz. Um, this comes in more important in a second when we talk about acquisition and tracking, but it's just important to know that um, we talked about um, down converting the signal from the carrier to, to a low frequency. Um, you actually, even if, even if that frequency is nominally zero, you typically have to, to mix it again down um, in software. Uh, to accommodate for the Doppler shift. Um, okay, so the navigation message gives uh, the, gives us some information about the uh, orbits of the satellites. So we need the um, information about where the satellites are to know where to know where the, our position is in three space relative to them. Um, so as we said before, the navigation message is transmitted at 50 baud. Um, there are 20 code periods in each navigation bit, so at the, at the end of the um, 20 code periods, you may or may not have a flip in the, uh, the sign of the signal um, due to the navigation bits. The whole message takes 12 and a half minutes to transmit, which is why old school receivers will take 12 and a half minutes to give you your first position solution. Um, so to sum up, we have um, these kind of two paths that come together to give us our position solution that come from the code correlations. On the right hand side um, is the, the, the flow of signal processing to get the ranges to the satellites. You start with code correlations. From the correlations, you can infer the code phase. From the code phase, you can infer the time of flight. From the time of flight, you can infer the distance to the satellite. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, code correlations also give you the navigation message, which allows you to extract data about uh, satellite positions. And now. 
Okay, so in the uh, the previous section, we introduced basically uh, so all the all the operations which we need to implement a GPS receiver. Uh, now we're going to talk a bit more about how um, how uh, these techniques are used in a specific specific way. And almost all GPS receivers um, uh, have effectively two modes of operation, which use these these same basic operations in in two different ways, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, the, uh, the, the first of these is called acquisition, and this comes in when your receiver is just starting up from cold, and you have no information about the satellites whatsoever. Um, you don't have any, any estimate, really, of their, um, what their, their code phase or the Doppler shift. These are the two parameters that we're interested in that uniquely determine where, you know, uh, uh, how we're receiving that, that satellite is the, the code, code phase and Doppler shift. So if you have no information, uh, you start in this mode called acquisition. Um, and we've got these two parameters, and effectively ac all acquisition is, is just an exhaustive search over the whole, whole two-dimensional space of um, code phase and Doppler shift. Um, so here's a, a plot taken from um, some, some real data. And uh, all we've done here is just searched over all the possible values of code phase, naught to 1,023, um, bits worth of shift. And uh, Doppler shift, I think we're here, the range is uh, plus or minus five kilohertz, something like that. Um, and we're, we're just searching, you know, for every point in this space, we, we, we uh, try out a, a cross-correlation and, and um, plot the magnitude of that, cross -cor of, of that correlation and uh, see um, if there's, there's any signal present. And as you can see, you know, you have this noise floor, but then, uh, a pretty substantial peak uh, where the satellite is present. Um, but as you can imagine, this is quite a large space, and each of these operations takes a you know, not, not insignificant amount of time because you're effectively doing a 1,023-bit integration. Um, so this is a very expensive process, and we want to uh, avoid, avoid doing it uh, um, if we can, uh, if, if there's a faster way we can do it. Uh, so our, if we um, can find a cheap, cheaper alternative, then we can uh, provide our user with more frequent updates in, in the position solution. We can uh, you know, uh, track more satellites at the same time, or we can run at lower power. Uh, so we want to avoid using, you know, this is why we can't use acquisition to, to perform every, every measurement. Um, and, uh, and it's also why you would try and make this, this uh, acquisition grid as coarse as possible. Um, I think that's about all there is to acquisition. Yeah. So like Ferg said, acquisition is a very resource intensive process. Um, and so we use a different method to quote unquote track the signal once we've acquired it in that two dimensional space to update the, that uh, code phase and um, carrier frequency. Um, so this shows you um, roughly how the, uh, the code uh, frequency is updated by the tracking loops. So instead of doing um, 1,023 correlations, or you generally actually do more than that in acquisition, um, we only have to do three correlations. We do one where we think the, the signal is, and that's the, that's the prompt correlation. We do one right before where we think it is, the early correlation, we do one right after. And through those three, we can kind of get a metric of how our locally generated code signal matches up with uh, the, re the received code signal. So on the left, you can see the case where it matches up pretty well. The prompt correlation is right in the center of that peak, the correlation peak, and, and the early and late have a, approximately the same um, value. Um, in the center, you can see the early case, where the early correlation is the greatest and um, the prompt and later less. And we, we uh, use, we, we subtract the late correlation from the early correlation and to give us uh, an idea of, of what the, uh, our, our error in our local code is. And you can see when the, uh, when that uh, when the early minus late correlation is greater than zero, 
then we know that our code, our locally generated code, is a bit faster than the code that we've received, and so we have to slow it down a little bit on the next integration period. Um, on the right, you can see the the late uh, case where the late correlation is the greatest, and you have um, the opposite case, early minus late correlation is uh, less than zero. Um, so this early minus late correlation is commonly called the discriminator, and that feeds a delay locked loop that helps us uh, filter out our code frequency and um, get a lock on it. The, car the tracking of the carrier frequency or the Doppler shift is done in a very similar way. Um, the discriminator is calculated slightly differently using the in phase and quadrature correlations, but it's it's very similar. Um, here you can see a, a plot of some real-time tracking we did. Um, the blue signal is the quadrature signal and the uh, red signal is the in-phase signal. Um, if you remember from that analog slide, the analog front end, um, when we sample the signals we actually have two, um, we have two signal, digital signals that we've sampled, the in-phase and quadrature versions. Those are 90 degree shifted. Uh, uh, mixed down signals. Um, you can see um, the nav bit transitions in the red signal as it shifts from like positive 40,000 to negative 40,000. Um, the code and carrier tracking loops are done in such a manner that they ignore these bit transitions. Uh, in the beginning you can see the, the red, the, um, the red signal kind of ramping up and that corresponds to our uh, tracking loops, uh, the, the frequency of the code and carrier getting more accurate, um, and thus the correlation um, becoming greater. Okay, so um, we wanted to focus in this presentation on the, the te technical aspects of GPS because, you know, that's what we find interesting and we wanted to give you a flavor of, um, you know, that, that side of it. But just uh, briefly, we'll introduce uh, a couple of new tools that um, y you might be interested in using if you were um, uh, wanted to, to, to pursue doing some, some experimentation in this area. Um, so I guess uh, it's probably good to start with a, a little survey of, of what's, what's already available. Um, very quickly, we have something like a Mublox receiver. Um, Really, really amazing receiver for like a hundred bucks. You can get two and a half meters of accuracy, uh, five hertz update in position solution. Um, it's, it's small, it's low power, uh, really nice integrated little unit, uh, more similar to, to what you have in your, uh, your car navigation system or, or your cell phone. But it's, it's completely black box. There's not really any, anything you can tune on it, no, no parameters to, be, to tweak. Uh, you pretty much just, just get what you're given. Um, and it doesn't implement any of these, uh, Colin mentioned it, there are these advanced positioning techniques which uh, are pretty useful. For example, carrier phase RTK where you're taking two receivers and doing a, a, a differential measurement between the two of them and this is, gives you like centimeter level precision and a receiver like this would, would not implement any, any higher, higher performance techniques like that. Uh, going up a step, you've got uh, fantastic products from companies like Novatel. Uh, I didn't actually get a quote on this uh, receiver, but it's like a four-figure kind of number. Uh, shaves a meter of, uh, off the, um, the position error compared to, to a, a Mublox type receiver. And uh, it, it's got firmware upgrades, so you can add all of these fancy features. But again, it's pretty much just a black box. There are a few basic parameters you can tweak, but it's not very flexible. Um, going up a step again, in, so, in some ways you've got uh, products like the Namaru from some guys at, I think it's the University of New South Wales. So for like $6,600 you can get a, a really nice platform. Um, and if you buy it, you get the source code, you get the board files, you get um, uh, all of the, the, the details of the hardware so you can go and tweak it. But it's not open source, uh, it's pretty much a closed platform. And it's still fairly bulky and uh, power hungry. It's not something you can just duct tape on your quadcopter and go flying. Um, so we kind of wanted to fill this gap uh, a bit. 
so I guess the first tool is, uh, is a library. Um, there are uh, a couple of, of really good open source GPS toolkit libraries out there, but um, we found none of them really met our needs. Um, so in libswiftnav, we've try to implement all of the, the basic building blocks of a, of a GPS receiver, you know, the, as Colin talked about, like uh, this, these uh, tracking loops, the uh, performing the navigation solution from the distances, the pseudo ranges, all of these uh, building blocks. Um, unlike the other libraries that are available, um, it's designed to be really lightweight. It's, uh, it's portable, standard C, no dependencies, apart from, I think, the C standard library. Even that you could, uh, you could factor out pretty easily. Um, it's fast, it's lean. Uh, we run it on a, on a microcontroller, a pretty low power microcontroller. Um, so in contrast to the other existing libraries which you might run on your, your machine locally with just an analog to digital converter plugged in, this is something you can run on an embedded system. Um, and it's designed to be flexible. Uh, you can prototype new ideas with it uh, quickly. Um, so yeah, hopefully this, this is something which will prove to be useful to other people. And uh, just briefly, this is a hardware platform which we've come up, it, uh, come up with. It runs this library that we mentioned. Uh, on there you've got a, a microcontroller. It's the, the fairly new STM32 F4 from ST. Uh, it's, it's a Cortex-M4 core, so it's pretty lightweight, but it does have a few DSP instructions. It's got a uh, hardware, hardware single precision floating point, which is pretty handy. Um, and it's pretty low power. We've also got a Spartan 6 on there, FPGA. And that uh, is basically, it doesn't do anything that smart. It's just filled to the brim with uh, very basic correlators, um, which the, the STM can go and uh, program to perform correlations against different codes or you know, uh, all the parameters of the correlation and just get return the result back. Um, it's low power, depending on the firmware you're running. Uh, it's, it's a little under half a watt. Uh, it's small, it's like a couple inches square. Um, so yeah, uh, these are our new tools. Um, and uh, I think we've got a little, little extra time, so I guess we can take a couple of questions. The cost? Um, so we're currently just gearing up to do a, like a beta, a beta run. Um, and we're looking at around $1,000. Um, yep. yep. Uh, no, we haven't. Um, it should should build uh, pretty easily on something like a Raspberry Pi. Um, that that should work fine. Yeah, you just need to find a way to get your um, front end data in, uh, which should be easy enough. But uh, should should build on any any system with a same C compiler. Sorry? You'll have to shout. <laughs> TV tuna chips. TV tuna chips? Um, we haven't. I know um, uh, some people have had some success. The uh, uh, GNU radio guys use uh, those TV tuna chips quite successfully. I'm not sure if they've received GPS. Um, I guess the problem you may have is sensitivity. They're not as sensitive as a dedicated GPS front end. What we've got on the, the Pixie is. Um, uh, a, a Maxim front end dedicated for GPS. Okay, and we're out of time. So uh, we'll be in Q&A room three if uh, anyone else has any questions. Thanks.